Okay, so this is part two of, um, our, of, of the week one lecture. So we already had a, the, the big 45 minute chunk of lecture one, what is violence? Um, now, this is, now we're carrying on with the same lecture into part two. This is going to be quite a bit shorter. And we're still covering that uh, reading by James Gilligan um, on how to think about violence. Okay, so we've said, um, you know, that, that, um, that we already have a theory of violence um, and we just don't really know what it is usually. Um, and we've said that one of the big underlying, th well, there are two, there's this kind of like um, the, the theological, moralistic kind of like uh, bad people do bad things and that explains violence. And then, we, and then the kind of like um, slightly sort of more contemporary version of that is this rational self-interest is that people are violent because they gain something from it. And if we give them a disincentive, if we give them a punishment that outweighs the gain, then they'll stop being violent. And that's what our criminal justice system is to a large extent based on, um, but not entirely. Okay. Now, Gilligan says, okay, if we say that's not enough, what what are we saying then? What, 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 what possibility are we then introducing that wasn't there already? If we say that simply saying it's wrong, evil, bad, or simply saying it's, uh, it's goal-directed and we just make it uh, an outcome that outweighs the, the goal and then people will stop. We don't say that. What, what are we looking for then? Okay, and he says here, and this is a lot of what his book is about, and it's totally worth reading his book. It's a very easy kind of, um, it's not like reading a big, heavy academic book. It's, it's just like really interesting descriptions of his work and the people he interacted with. Okay, so what is he looking for? And he says, okay, if the violence is not simply about some material benefit, okay, if it's not simply like, oh, if I kill you, I'll get the life insurance. If I mug you, I'll get your phone and the cash that's in your wallet. If it's not about that, what is it about? And he says, material gain is not the only kind of gain. Um, that's one of the problems. We mustn't think of violence and we mustn't even think about crime as only about material gain. There are other kinds of kickbacks, other kinds of advantage, other kinds of needs that are served um, uh, by doing things. Okay, And he's saying, that essentially we need to look at, at also at the dimension of the psychological and the social gains and losses that are involved. What do people gain psychologically by acts of violence? What do they gain socially by acts of violence? Um, and that opens up the question much more broadly than just assuming it's about sort of material um, interests. And, he, and, and here he, he really starts getting into what's interesting in this book. And he says, people feel, this is a direct quote I'm reading, people feel incomparably more alarmed by a threat to the self than they are by a threat to the body. The death of the self is a far greater concern than the death of the body. People will willingly sacrifice their bodies if they perceive it as the only way they can avoid, and he puts in inverted commas, losing their souls or losing their minds or losing face. Okay, so he's saying like, yeah, look, sometimes people are violent uh, in self-defense. They're afraid. Like there's some, you know, the cop uh, says, oh, it was self-defense. Uh, he, was, he was resisting arrest. And so I had to shoot him. Okay. And you're like, oh, and, that, and that, that may stand or fall as a defense in court. Or someone says, oh, this, this home invader, uh, he came at me with a, with a baseball bat. And so I had to stab him. And yeah, you, you can explain that. Uh, uh, a, a defensive reaction to a threat to the body. Um, and, and the legal provisions for that and the legal limitations on that too. Um, but Gilligan's saying, you know, people actually feel more threatened by emotional stuff than for sure they feel terrified by threats to their body. But one of the things that, 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 that is a trigger or a precursor for a lot of violence is threats to the kind of sense of self, um, not just physical threats. Um, um, so in, there, there are many examples of the way in which people will feel like because there's a threat to, to, this, to, 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 to their sense of self, that someone is um, humiliating them, someone is denying them 
uh, a kind of their their humanity, and they and and they will engage in acts of violence um, because of that. Um, and and we see this so often. Um, for instance, in fights, it's very. This is kind of a classic kind of bar fight scenario. Um, is that someone, you know, say someone bumps into someone and doesn't apologize and the other person, what the hell, like, you know, don't disrespect me like that. Um, and then, you know, the, and, and then there's a kind of an altercation and they, they and, and rather than, than it sort of being an apology and an acknowledgement of the other person, there's a kind of a antagonism and an attempt to assert oneself and humiliate the other person. And it escalates until someone, there's a kind of one of these, you know, um, uh, a punch up and someone ends up with a head injury and perhaps ends up uh, um, d dying from from what is essentially just a, a stupid fight over over feeling disrespected okay and he says this, there's a lot of this stuff in the same way that you know people may may join that may exact, engage in an act of terrorism because they feel like there's a threat to themselves later on in the course we'll talk about that Christchurch killer and the way in which he felt like as a kind of a, as a white man, there was a threat to his culture and way of life um, by people from other countries, people from other cultures. And he felt, he felt such a threat. And it's a kind of, I mean, you can see it's a crazy threat, but he really felt it. He really believed that, that he as a person, he as a representative of a certain historical culture was, was under threat. Uh, and because of that, he had to fight back. And so he, so he drew this kind of, you know, outrageous conclusion that he, that he should go into strangers' place of worship and murder them, because he felt so threatened by this idea that his culture was, was getting lost. Um, and Gilligan says we need to look at that stuff. We need to look at that. Um, like example, like. Um, as I'm giving this lecture, it's kind of middle of 2020, we're freaking out about the COVID pandemic, or some people aren't, and some people haven't been, and that's made it worse, because they haven't um, been observing the safety precautions. And a couple of, there have been a couple of cases in the United States where people have killed someone for asking them to wear a mask. Like literally a guy walks into a shop, the store security says, sorry, you can only enter this shop if you put on a face covering to protect other customers. And the and, and this potential customer has been so outraged by the request to, to cover their face that they have actually murdered the store security. Um, and, and Gilligan says, we need to understand this because there's no simple incentive there. Like, Yes, we and, and it doesn't help to say that person's crazy. That, that, is, that is not a very useful thing to simply say, oh, well, that's just, a, that's just a crazy person being crazy. No, they're a person who's come to believe certain things and hold certain values. And if you look at this, look at the kind of anti-masking kind of social networks, they're all about like, this is my freedom, uh, my freedom not to do this, my freedom not to be restricted in this way, and you, you imposing a political tyranny on me. And we can disagree with that view, and we can say that view is preposterous and not based on evidence. Nevertheless, it is believed and felt by people. And that guy going into the shop really believed that he was unfairly having his basic human rights restricted. Um, and he wasn't being respected as a as a freedom loving American citizen, and because of that, he was going to exercise his rights as a freedom loving American citizen to use violence against other people because he regards that as one of his rights, alongside his Second Amendment right to carry a gun. Um, and and so when we look at this, there's actually deep beliefs in that situation. It's not just yes, you can say it's crazy. Just like you can say, oh, it's evil. But that doesn't tell us the interesting stuff. How did he come to feel such a big threat to himself that he actually murdered someone? And he murdered them in public, and so he was going to get caught, and he's going to go to jail now. He's not going to get acquitted. Um, why was he prepared to do that? And Gilligan says, this is what we need to understand. We need to understand how deeply people feel these kinds of ideas of honor, self-respect, dignity, um, and, and that when those things get threatened, people start acting in very radical ways. In the same way, 
things like a sense of loss or sense of jealousy. Um, and one of the big kind of causes of violence in relationships is when a relationship is deteriorating and a person feels, okay, I'm being ba abandoned now. Um, I'm, I'm losing this thing that is so important to me. And they, and, they, and, and they suddenly become extremely violent in that situation. And Gilligan wants us to look at this. He wants us to say, look, there's social and psychological stuff going on with a lot of violence. A lot of it isn't just material gain oriented. And we need to investigate that very deeply. Um, and so that's one of the things I want to do, want, want to do in this course, to say what it would mean to go down those roads, to say, well, yes, that, that Christchurch killer, that guy who, who killed the, the store security who asked him to put on a face mask before he came into the shop, um, that, 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 that person who kills his, his wife and children because their marriage is falling apart, what's going on with them? Um, and it's interesting, you know, because there's this term we have, senseless violence. I mean, it's, and sometimes it's also the term gratuitous violence, like, oh, I don't want to watch that movie. It's just gratuitous violence. Or, or like, why would he have done that? That senseless violence. He didn't need to kill that person to achieve that goal. And it's interesting because when we use this term senseless violence, or even the term gratuitous violence, like gratuitous violence, violence that's unnecessary for the story. It's unnecessary to have that violence, just extra added on top, doesn't serve a purpose other than just to be a noise. Um, senseless violence. It implies something else, that there is sensible violence, that there is violence which is reasonable and rational. Oh, I can see why he killed him. Yeah, I get, I get it. That's not crazy, that's rational. So, so, so essentially what we're saying is we believe like certain violence is, is rational. We may disagree with it. We may think it's wrong. We may think it should be punished. But we at least believe it's rational. Versus these other kinds of violence which are just senseless. Like he didn't have to do that. That's just crazy. Okay. And, it, and, and, and it's precisely there. It's, it's both in this moment where we say, oh, that's just evil or that's just crazy. Those are not those are, those are not thinking words. Those are words that actually shut down our thinking. Um, they're words like to say crazy or, or evil. They're, they're just shortcuts for us not to understand something. If we really understood it, we would see that those things, the things we call evil, the things we call crazy, actually have understandable conditions behind that. And that's what we want to get at. We want to stop using these kind of shortcuts that, that are an alternative to thinking and understanding. We actually want to do the, the, the investigation um, to say, yes, but what is, there is, a, there is a coherence. There's something understandable, even in the most shocking behavior. And we want to get at that because if we can understand it, we can hopefully get to the point where we can do something about it. Okay, and think about this, that this is always there, you know, like the, the example used before, you're watching your, your kind of TV series about serial killers and, and suddenly you're getting presented with an understanding, oh, this, 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 this person's being a serial killer, oh, they're, they're not, they're, yeah, on the one that, oh my God, they're crazy, they're just evil. And then it's like, no, wait a minute, there's more, there's a story. Okay, and, and, and remember the, the, what I mentioned before. Oh, here now we start understanding the story about this person's family and they were brought up as an orphan and they were beaten by their adoptive parents and they were neglected and they were humiliated. And it's actually a story of a psychological development. This person, what, through neglect and abuse, um, became they, like they something happened to them mentally and emotionally, and now they and this is what explains their their obsessive repetitive cruelty to other people sure and and that 's a kind of an explanation, and we want to test those explanations we say is it does it work like that? this kind of intuitive trauma theory, this psychological development theory um, how do those things work? How can we understand them? If they're true, how can we prevent that happening to people? We want to know that stuff. Okay. But there is also a risk in only focusing on psychological factors. That if we say, yes, there's, there's deeper reasons for doing this, we can, we can then say, yeah, well, we can tell psychological stories. We can tell stories of emotional development, of, of um, uh, those kinds of things. And, and those will certainly be very revealing, and we're going to look at some of them in a lot of depth. But we don't want to stop there. 
there's there's a real risk in 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 the psychological explanation being the only other one we go to. We need to look at others. And and here Gilligan and Stanko both make the same point is that there's a kind of broad range of other places we can go. Um, and they what, often the three that are brought this is kind of a common sort of academic kind of like grouping of three things. They said, well, firstly, there may be biological factors. There may be actual physical things wrong with the person. They may have, a, uh, they may have had a, been in a motorbike accident and have a brain injury, and this has made them like, act impulsively violent. Okay? There may be psychological factors. You know, there may be this childhood trauma or something. And there may be social factors. And those social factors may be very complex. They may be cultural, they may be historical, they may be socioeconomic, um, but we need to get at those. And now in this course, we're not really going to explore the biological factors. Um, uh, those are not a, a, a huge part of the way we're going to approach violence. Some other people have done it that way, and there have been some insights, but a lot of problems in that work. We're going to look at the kind of a lot of the social stuff, and we're going to bring in some psychological stuff. So we're going to we're going to balance those two um, and try and achieve a deeper understanding of of violence that way. Okay, now that's Gilligan. Now, if you read this the Stanko article, the one about the meanings of violence, one of the interesting arguments made there, and this is absolutely fundamental for the course is the idea that there isn't a simple meaning. Like I said to you earlier, you, you know what violence is. And I said, give me three examples of, of violence. And, and you could name three, that's, that's easy, okay? And I want you to do that, actually write down, like what do you think your examples of obvious violence are? Um, but, but, but in the meanings of violence, a number of things become clear, it's firstly, different things get called violence and not get called violence. Violence gets understood in different ways, like different, like people assume like, oh, this must be because of, this violence must be because of that. Um, um, but also the very, the very meaning of the word is, is contested. And it's, um, it's, it's contested in a number of different ways. Um, so let's look briefly at some definitions of violence. These are like from standard sort of academic textbooks. I'm going to read them to you. Okay. So, so if you, and think about it. If, if I said to you, what is violence? Give me a one sentence definition of what is violence. What would you say? Think about that. How would you answer this question? What is violence in one sentence? Write it down. And actually pause this video and write it down. That'll be really helpful. Okay, so here are some of the traditional definitions. An infliction of injury on another human being. Okay, nice, clear. You know, scientists, they're always trying to make it clear. They don't want it to be fuzzy and open-ended. They want it to be clear, focused. An infliction of injury on another human being. Okay, so there's three things going on in that definition. You must watch this. You must watch these definitions very carefully. Infliction of injury. It's not just an injury that happened. You know, uh, the injuries that just happened, ah, I fell off my bike, I got injured, but that injury wasn't inflicted, okay? It's just that you just fell off your bike and you just hurt yourself. Okay, the infliction of injury on another human being. Now, firstly, there's injury, okay? The person was hurt. We can see there's blood, there's a, there's a bullet hole, there's a stab wound, there's a broken jaw, there's a black eye, there's an injury. The doctor can say, yes, I can see the injury on this person. Okay. So, so secondly, there's injury. So infliction means that someone has done something. It's not a thing that just happened. You didn't just fall off the ladder, drop the hammer on your toe. Someone did, they inflicted it, they did it. So someone has done the violence. The violence has caused a physical harm to, to the other person, and, the, and, and it's an injury of a human being. Okay, so A, violence is done by someone, it involves physically harming them, and it is something that's done to human beings. Okay, and that's really interesting. You might want to say, okay, oh, we can see that. We can see why someone would want to say, infliction of injury on other human beings, nice. But wait a minute, wait a minute. 
there, there's something I'm not happy with there. Hey, can you be violent to an animal? You kick a puppy. Is that violence? You know, take a pellet gun and shoot some lorikeets. Is that an act of violence? Um, uh, keeping animals in a circus. Is that violence? Like here's one. Um, having an animal killed so that you can eat it. Is that violence? Is going to the supermarket and buying a piece of steak that involved an animal being kept under conditions of a captivity and then killed. Is that violence towards that animal or isn't it? Interesting question, really, a really interesting question. Okay, but you see the guy in the street kicking your puppy. Is that an act of violence? I think, I can't imagine someone saying that's not violent. Now we can argue about buying the steak in the supermarket. That's, we can argue about that a lot actually. But no, I think, you know, if you kick that puppy, I want to call that an act of violence. I don't want to get into, I don't think it's a big discussion to happen. Um, but then, you know, you, well, if I swat that mosquito that's trying to bite me, is, is that an act of violence? Now we've got a problem. If I, if I, if I put ant poison down, is that violence? So that's, so it gets very weird. Yes, we want to talk about violence towards people, but we also want to say, yeah, but it's not only people that are, that can be violent, but then it gets so really weird and complicated. Okay. Let's look at another, another definition. Violence implies the use of force. Okay. The use of force to harm, injure, or abuse others. Okay, so something's been added in this, the use of force. Okay, the first one said infliction. Yeah, infliction, what, what do you mean infliction? Use of force, okay, use physical force from harm, injure, or abuse, okay, and others. So others seems to imply that we're still talking about humans. Harm, injure, or abuse. Now, the first definition just said injury. So we'd like, we talk, you know, broken arm, broken jaw, bullet hole, injury, okay? Now we're saying harm. What do we mean by harm? Can you have a harm without a physical injury? And wait a minute, what do we mean by abuse? Use of force to abuse others. What does that mean? So suddenly this question of injury then in the first definition, like what are we calling an injury? Is an injury only mean a physical injury that a doctor would be able to document? Are there other kinds of injury? Are there other kinds of harm? Are there kinds of abuse that don't involve um, a physical injury? Yes, of course, of course there are. I, I can be verbally abusive, I can insult you. But is that a kind of violence? When someone, when, 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 so, when someone verbally insults you, is that violent or is that something else? Um, the first definition would say that's not included in our understanding of violence. The second one seems to, yeah, but it's including the word abuse, but it's saying this use of force. So is calling, is, is, is using a, 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 a insulting, humiliating sort of word um, to describe someone? For, uh, I would say, a, what about a racist or a sexist word um, to describe someone? Is that a use of force? To say those words, is that a use of force? Because surely it can, it's abusive. And, and, and let's say it can do a kind of harm, an emotional harm, but is it a use of force? So maybe that definition, okay, maybe it's not exactly right. Let's try this one, a, a, a more developed definition. Destructive harm, including not only physical assaults that damage the body, okay? destructive harm, so it's not just harm, it's destructive harm, including not only physical assaults that damage the body, but also the many techniques for inflicting harm by mental or emotional means, okay? So here they're saying, definitely, we're not just talking about physical injury. We're talking about the many techniques for inflicting harm by mental, emotional. So they're saying there is such a thing as emotional harm. There's such a thing as mental harm, emotional harm. 
there are things you can do. There are ways of treating people without, that don't involve causing a physical hurt to them. You can cause a mental and emotional harm. Okay. But the interesting thing is they've wanted to put in the word destructive. Why would they want to put in the word destructive? Are, are there kinds of harms that aren't destructive? Oh, I mean, I felt bad, but it didn't harm me. Is that, is, so is it violent if it, if it feels bad and it harms you, but it's not violent if it feels bad and it doesn't harm you? If you felt bad, doesn't that mean you've been harmed anyway? Once again, where are we going with this? It's not so easy. The more we look at it, the, like we can see why they wanted to say, no, wait a minute, let's include mental and emotional. But it still hasn't wrapped the whole thing up. Okay, let's try this. This is a slightly different line of argument. Exaggerated harm to individual beyond established limits. Okay, so here we're getting this destructive harm thing that, you know, that, well, what kind of harm? That's here, exaggerated harm. Okay, what do we mean by exaggerated? Beyond established limits. Now, this is really interesting. Because what we're saying is that there's, there's harm that isn't exaggerated. There's a kind of ordinary harm. And there's harm that is within limits. Um, so there's ways in which I can harm you that, are, that we accept, that I can say, ah, oh, you're, you're, you're just a goddamn idiot. And, like, and you may feel really hurt by that. Okay, but that's within established limits. You know, brothers and sisters say that to each other. Parents insult their kids all the time. Um, that's within limits. It's not... It's not really violence. It's, it's exaggerated. It's beyond the kind of harm. Um, um, and so, and what's interesting about this is it says that what, when we think about violence, this is the crucial part of this definition. They're acknowledging that w what we call violence is in relation to social norms. Okay. That, that every society has certain norms about what's acceptable and not, is not, what is not acceptable. Is calling someone an idiot acceptable? Is, is using a, a racial term to refer to someone acceptable? Is spanking your children acceptable? Is um, slapping your, your, your wife acceptable? Different societies may have different answers to that question at different points in history. Okay, so, and the definition says violence is rela in relation to what a particular society accepts as being reasonable versus what is unreasonable. Is it reasonable for the police to put someone in a choke hold and choke them to death when they're resisting arrest, or isn't it? In some societies, that may be reasonable. In other societies, it's absolutely not. Okay, so the question of violence is defined in relation to social norms. And the final definition that I want you to look at is, the, is this one that, where it says that violence can also be the failure to exercise ordinary care. Okay, so that's essentially violence via neglect. So failure to exercise ordinary care. That's really interesting because here that's, it's not something someone did. It's not the use of force to injure, failure to, to, ex to, to, to exercise ordinary care. So, um, what, so, so what, would, what, what would an example of that be? Okay, so yes, I, I knew that, I knew that there, there was something terrible happening next to it. I heard the kids screaming and stuff being broken. Uh, the, I heard terrified screams, but it's not my business. It, that's their family. I just turned the music up and carried on trying to prepare my work. Um, and then next thing I see an ambulance arrive and the cops are there and the, and the child is, has been killed in a family violence incident. What have I done there? I failed to exercise ordinary care. I failed to, 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 I failed to call the cops and say, listen, I think there's an escalating violence situation next door. I don't know what it is, but it sounds worrying to me. And because I failed to exercise that ordinary care, some, some, someone, is, someone has, has been injured or someone has been murdered. Okay. So this definition says sometimes violence is not what you do. It's what you don't do.
And that's kind of radical. That really opens this. That means violence can be thought of as a much bigger thing. That simply not doing something can be violent. Think about what that means. Think about all the ways in which you not doing something could have harmed someone else. And here's a classic example. You know, the guy who, 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 who killed the, the shop security who asked him to wear a mask, that was obvious phys- destructive harm, physical violence, injury, yes. But by not wanting to c- for cover his face in the context of this highly infectious epidemic, was that an act of violence? Was refusing to cover his face in an enclosed um, uh, environment where there were other people so as to prevent the possibility of any transmission of this airborne virus? Is that, is refusing to wear a mask an act of violence? Is failure to exercise ordinary care to say, look, because people are infectious but don't have any symptoms, none of us actually know whether we are infectious or not, because you can be infectious for a week without having any symptoms. Therefore, to exercise ordinary care, to look after everyone else in the society around us, let's put on the face covering. Sure, that's totally reasonable, but can we use the word violence there? It's walking into that shop and saying, I won't cover my face. Is that an act of violence? And I leave that with you as a question. Like uh, for you personally, subjectively, in your kind of feelings and personal thoughts, is, is, is your feeling like, no, that's not an act of violence? Or is your feeling like, yes, that is an act of violence? And so, so, so stop and, and answer that question. Kind of write down the answer even. Say, yeah, yeah, no, 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 that's, that's bad, but it's not an act of violence. Or yes, no, I think we should call that violence. And then I want you to ask yourself the question, And why did I come to that conclusion? Why did I say, yes, it's an act of violence or no? I think it it may be wrong, but it's, it's not, it doesn't seem appropriate to call that violence. And why not then if it isn't? But here's the point. The point is that what we think of as violence, what we call violence, what we label violence, what we categorize under criminal law as violence, or what we categorize in our moral systems, as unacceptably violent or as acceptable behavior. These are things that are socially constructed. They depend on our history. They depend on our culture. They depend on the media around us. Not only are they socially constructed, but they are contested and they're changing. What may be considered violence in one context may not in another. You know, the, the, the way some people behaved in the 1970s, which was seen as acceptable, is now looked on with horror the way people, some people behaved in the 18th century um, and and thought was acceptable is now looked on with horror. Will there be a way in the 22nd century where people look back at us in in the 2020s and say, my God, what were they thinking? Why, Why did they think that was okay? So imagine a future world where people look back on us and say, oh my God, that's so abusive, that's so violent, that's so destructive. But we living in this moment say, yeah, but this is just what we do. I mean, that's normal. That's, it's, that's just a normal thing, okay? Um, what things that are normal for us might be looked at with horror and outrage by someone from another perspective? and be classified as violence from that perspective, even though for, from our perspective, it doesn't seem to make sense to call them violent. Because that's always happened historically. There've always been things that weren't called violent that then became recognized as being violent. So, how, so what are we going to look like to the people of the future? Think about that for a second. And then let's end uh, the second part of week one lecture with that.